I couldn't let the passing of uh, Sir Clive Sinclair um, go by without covering a little bit on the channel because uh, I think like most of the uh, people have been posting online with their um, condolences and, and, and their memories um, he changed my life um, I bought that ZX81 kit um, those of me following me on uh, on Twitter uh, no, it's uh, it was an agonising way to get it working with a kit having to go back for repair, um, but you know I was hooked the moment it is, and in fact my diary entries stopped for several months. Um, and we don't don't start again even then sporadically till November time now in 1981, 40 years ago. So um, I previously also had his um, or dad had had his Cambridge Scientific uh, programmable calculator, which was the first thing I was able to program on. And obviously moved on to the, the Spectrum, set up a company, started selling software, had the chance to work abroad, um, been in ICT all my life since. Um, and that wouldn't have happened without Clive, um, and that's just the computing side of it. But um, I've also got uh, quite a few magazines that have got his products in because he, it wasn't just um, the computers. Um, a lot of people pick up on the C5, which... Uh, one of my friends has actually got a C5, which is really nice for them. Um, and I, you know, they, he may be derided for, for doing something like that, but he, he was prepared to throw energy and innovation at a, a pretty much everything. Um, and some of the products beforehand, um, even the early ones, which isn't covered as well, I think, in the online tributes, you know, in the, as a, out of the sort of practical wireless uh, radio and wireless kits, um, and I've got a few magazines, maybe we can pick up some of the, the other uh, products and perhaps take a little look at the uh, MK14 as well as uh, as maybe a little bit underrepresented. Um, you know, you can play Moon Landed on that and you can play that on the Sinclair Cambridge Programmable, which uh, might be a nice uh, a nice thing to do as well. Um, so let's have a little look at some of these uh, computing and electronics magazines I've got and uh, just see uh, see what the magazines have got to see. The first uh, magazine I've got is uh, to look at Practical Wireless, February 1977. Um, I think a lot of uh, that, uh, for those who don't know, Clive Sinclair was an editor of Practical Wireless for a while, which is probably why he thought to advertise his products in here. Maybe there are other, uh, others didn't. Um, I'm sure there'll be a Sinclair advert in here. Sinclair Products, 839. There we go. <laughs> Of course, the calculator, which is uh, being sold out of Sinclair Instruments from Six Kings Parade, Cambridge. So, uh, great. What else we got? Um, now, Practical Wireless, uh, February 1978. Um, this was the uh, issue, um, famous one, I suppose, for Science of Cambridge, 743, uh, because it uh, is the... Um, launch uh, looking of the MK14 and it is MK not Mark because it's uh, it's 14 chips was what was needed to run it in theory if you include the, uh, uh, the uh, actual regulator it would be 14 silicon uh, devices so um, obviously that's a, a drawing a rendition of what it might look like not the actual product so uh, that's the one it came in uh, we got Practical Electronics, October 1978. Um, still got the stickers from that. So I'm not sure what I've got on this one. Um, Sinclair Radionics, 1091. Um, oh yes, of course, the uh, PDM35. Now for those into electronics, a digital multimeter would have been a great, uh, a great thing to have. Um, and only 29.95 as well. Oh. This is how I say knives as well. Um, September 1978, a VTI, um, with a space shuttle. Ah, that's got the MK14 review in it, if uh, anybody's looking for a, a review of the MK14. So it's page 27. Um, this, of course, is actually the, the real product now, so uh, it looks as it does. Well, it looks a bit different to our original picture. And Gary Evans has built news one. Um, it's quite a good technical article for those who don't know. It gives you a pin out of the keyboard and um, he 
he actually makes his own uh, ETI type keyboard because the keyboard was so bad. Um, but uh, generally, I think uh, the MK14 is not a toy with the low cost add ons. Uh, planned by Science of Cambridge should prove a powerful tool for those wanting a versatile MPU development system or under £80. So that's not a bad review for September 1978 from Gout in ETI. Um, what we got in October 1978 as well. Um, what we got in uh, Practical Electronics. Science of Cambridge, page 41. And of course, this is now pretty much everything that they're doing with the MK14. So you've got the, uh, the EEPROM programmer cassette interface, um, the VDU, um, the fascinating device. Um, and of course, you've, you've basically still only got um, 512 bytes of RAM plus 128 bytes in the I.O. chip, uh, which pretty much everything you need for that VDU. And then our details about how to change the decoder to allow one and a half K of expansion memory to be put onto it as well in the manual from my version four onwards, I think. Um, and probably the last couple of mags I kind of want to quick look at is Personal Computer World because um, going back to 1978, Personal Computer World covered the this is their second issue, so volume one, number two, which covered the pet. Uh, but in that, of course, they there's no chimp on the front for those who know the story of these magazines. But um, they covered, uh, I believe, the MK14 here, Mitri Micromate on page 10. They also cover the MK14, uh, how its addressing works. As you can see, I've got a lot of space basically, so it runs downwards for those used to zero at the bottom. So. Um, lots of echoes of the RAM and the ROM in it, which is what has to be done. Um, so it's interesting. This one actually is written by Nick Toop, as we've gone back in time a little bit. And uh, he summarises with conclusions. As an independent consumer, I was very impressed by this kit. It's low cost and versatile, but economic design are very pleasing. I'm sure that it will have great success. So that was... Um, 978 in the middle of 78 now the review we saw in october of 78 include on the um uh, ma magazine advert had the vdu which actually was designed by nick Toop, who went to work for sinclair well maybe as a result of that advert who knows or well, that that article and review now for those who know the story personal computer world covered pretty much all of clive sinclair's releases um so they covered the zx80 in april 1980 um um, and they've also got a little article of adding some muscle to your MK14, so they were covering it. Um, the muscle to the MK for beefing up the MK14, 63. Um, so they're beefing it up. It's basically coming up with a, a method of expanding by hooking onto the, the CPU uh, socket. Uh, it's quite an ex extensive expansion capability for uh, building the machine up. So it's quite a good article. Um, one of those things I'll probably get around to at some time. Um, and what else? Obviously they got the the bench test 55. Uh, Mr. David Tebbett uh, looks at the Sinclair ZX80 and that's, as I said, on page 55. Uh, um, bench test um, covers it. Quite a bit, several pages here. So basic future plans uh, at a glance. So it's value for money. It's got five stars. Excellent. Um, and thanks go to Clive Sinclair for Lenders and Machine and to Jim Westwood, his designer, for patiently answering so many questions. Uh, and this was the machine I. Uh, you may have noticed I was wearing a t-shirt earlier. Um, this is the machine I was saving up to buy. Um, has Sinclair got an advert in you, maybe? He must have taken an advert in the magazine, I would have thought. Um, bring the blue advertisers. Yeah. Science of Cambridge, 30 and 31. I suspect they're probably advertising. Are they advertising? Oh, yeah, there we are. It's the ZX80 in its two-page friend. Now, this is the, the one I really started getting interested in, and in fact, was the one I saw at the... Uh, Computer Club, owned by the master teacher, Mr Arnold, who lent me the uh, the book to take home to study. 
Um, so this is what I was saving for when, of course, the next one, which does another, which is the start of the Chimp mag magazines in Personal Computer World. So this is June of 1981, the ZX81 was announced and uh, uh, I'd ordered one of those immediately. So I obviously avidly read this magazine to find a review of it. Um, this is my original from back in the day, that's the poor state of it. But um, where have we got? Must have an article here. Bench test, there we are. 66, the editor gets his paws on Sinclair's new micro. Perhaps couldn't see that for looking. <laughs> uh, that's 73 there. I think actually, I've actually pulled the review of the ZX81 out here. I've probably got it somewhere else. I'll have to go and find that. Yes, as if by magic, here's my other copy actually, <laughs> uh, which does contain the uh, review on page 65, I'm sure. Uh, 64. There we go, there it is, with all the photographs of the chimp posed around it. Um, and the review. Uh, right from the start, it better explain that the ZX81 costs £50 in kit form and £70 ready built, and as such, represents absolutely amazing value for money. Whatever shortcomings are highlighted in the bench test must be weighted against this fact. Um, yeah, he's obviously got on the printer as well and the 16K RAM pack in view. Um, I got mine working on a Saturday after I came back from St. Clair and I was ordering the RAM pack by the Monday. <laughs> so. Uh, go to page 154 here then. So it's quite a long uh, article about it. 154 and there's the end of it. Conclusions. So uh, he's done it again. Uncle Clive has come up with a lovely product which will have enormous appeal to people wanting to find out more about computers without costing an arm and a leg. So there we go. He loves it. So I'm sure that it will do extremely well Far better, in fact, than the ZX80, and that's rapidly becoming the biggest selling micro in the world. If you know nothing about computers and you want to enjoy finding out about them, then this machine offers a value for money way of doing just that. Children will love the ZX81, there can be no question about that, and I suspect that more than a few people already familiar with computers will buy one just to have a bit of fun. So I couldn't disagree with him, and I'm sure we've got the, uh, the advert from from Sinclair in here, if we have a little look at it, Sons of Cambridge 120 and 121. So will this be a colour advert by now? I remember that, that colour advert was really, uh, really drooled over that. There we go, two page spread. You, who wouldn't want that? I was looking forward to the printer as well. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? There we go. And of course, here they covered the Spectrum then with another chimp on the cover in June of 1982. And the rest of it is pretty much history, I suppose. So uh, I'm fairly certain, and this has still got the insert in it, which is nice for the actual Spectrum, which is again is all I had to go on for a long time. Looking at this, pouring over it with the differences, uh, getting ready with the uh, practicing my assembly on the ZX81 and writing some routines ready from some ideas and articles in magazines. Um, and I'm sure we've got a, a Sinclair advert in there as well somewhere, Prospect. Uh, we might not actually have one because it's inserted 64, 120 and 121. Oh, no, they've actually got an advert in there for the ZX81. Even though the Spectrum is an insert, and so 64 is perhaps the insert, maybe? No, it's for their software on cassette. So uh, plenty of big colour advertising in there. Um, I assume they liked the Spectrum, did they? You can find the, uh, in, where is it? Page 118. Volume 6, 117. Well, it's actually the ZX81 advert in the middle of it. He's done it again, hasn't he? Uncle Clive has gone and shown the world how to produce a decent colour personal computer at the sort of price only he can conceive. Two versions of the Spectrum are available. So what do they say about it? That's quite clever to get their colour photo in the middle. So Spectrum made Clive pay for that colour page. Um, lots about it. What about the 81? 
which still go in. Potential use, conclusions. Well, for the benefit of those who only read the first and last paragraphs of these reviews, that's us. <laughs> Here are my conclusions. He's produced a very good 16K personal commuter which offers colour, high resolution graphics and limited sound for just £125. That represents very good value for money, provided this is the sort of machine that you want. My verdict, the best value for money you can find today. Isn't that great? And I thank as well this time John Matheson of Sinclair Research for so patiently answering the questions. So there we go. And of course, then the next computer I, I had is the uh, June 1984 with the Sinclair QL, Chimp or Champ. I think we uh, we all know how that one turns out. You know, bench test and review, Sinclair QL, page 170. What was actually their conclusion then? Uh, again, got a couple of pages, nice big cutaway diagram in the middle of it. So photographs inside the machine. So, pretty close. And he opens with, Was I the only person in the world who wondered what all the fuss was about when the QL was launched? <laughs> uh, people kept on about the Motorola 68128K of memory. Not to mention a souped-up version of BASIC. Multitasking and Windows were thrown at me in generous attempt to win me around. But everything failed. No matter how I tried, I could not get enthusiastic about the QL. Yeah, that's a shame because uh, I was. I was. Uh, we went up to uh, um, Sinclair's headquarters to pick up a, a QL. Uh, coming back on the train with it in a, it wasn't in a box. It was just in a brown sort of jiffy bag uh, to develop some software for it early under an NDA. Several people sat in the train, <laughs> all looking at each other, and able to talk to each other, thinking they probably got a QL in that bag. Um, but the bottom line is that the QL gives you the potential to own a complete serious computing facility, including printer and essential software for under £1,000. Well, under that, if you're prepared to use a domestic TV rather than a monitor for the display. So it's no doubt that the QL is a well-made piece of hardware. The operating system, the applications and the basic look very good on paper. The review machine was still short of a few facilities. That either means the deliveries will start soon and early buyers will need some sort of upgrade, which is exactly what happened because he has a dongle hanging out the back, or the project is going to be delayed further while the software is completed. If everything were in place, then I would consider this machine very seriously as a truly personal computer, but not as something to run a business on. Okay, he was on about the Scion software then. So, the chimp. Um, we don't get a chimp for the uh, this issue, which is the 100th Personal Computer World in April 1986, but peeking out the top corner is the Spectrum 128 appears at last. <laughs> so... Uh, where have we got here? So, should be a bench test. Yeah, Spectrum 128, page 124. Um, we got some good uh, good history of their old magazines as well, including the QL one. Uh, 124, 123, 124. So there we are, the Spectrum 128. Many original features sadly lacking in some of the basics, such as a screen and a disc which might have been expected of a Spectrum upgrade. Guy Cuny's uh, review. So, in the Spectrum 128 is so simple to describe that it hardly seems worth the bother writing it down. It's a Spectrum with more memory and a few new features, none of which remarkable or first of its kind, or even available at a new low price. Indeed, the price of the Spectrum 128 is £179, or it's planned to be. To get the benefits of the new machine, you need the optional editing keypad costing £20, which of course is incredibly rare today because they've never launched in the UK, I don't think. So, conclusion, uh, if you have to use a TV as a display, then it's nice to lose the annoying shimmering effect from having a go good uh, connection to RGB, of course. If you're fed up with 48K, well, you've got 128K. The sound output is a vast improvement on the beep, of course. The heat sink, uh, many uh, old catatonic machines. In other words, the Spectrum 128 is very much nicer than the old Spectrum, but pretty damn ordinary compared with everything else. It's a calculated gamble. Sinclair Research says that this is an evolutionary product. I say the company had better get a screen disc out for it, or it runs the risk of be having produced just a better dinosaur. Of course, Sinclair could always cut the price. That was a bit cutting, wasn't it? And then, of course, we jump a little bit forward another year then uh, to another chimp, which they reward for Sinclair. Sinclair rides again with the Z88. I think this is the only Sinclair machine I never actually had myself. Um, 
So, do we get a bench test for it? We do, 96. Just when you thought you'd become part of computing folklore, Sir Clive Sinclair reappears with a £200 lightweight lap held which sports integrated software and dozy concurrency. Could this be Sinclair's finest hour or is it just another example of theory greatly exceeding practice? Guy Cuny previews the Z88. Um, let's see his conclusion, shall we? Uh, at the price, if this works, I'd buy a Z88. It really is important if you're carrying the machine around that it is light. I use a Tandy 102 not because it has the functions need, but because it's the only machine which doesn't break my back at exhibitions. But even that is more weight than I'm comfortable with. My overall impression, if it works, it could be something new in a market that hasn't been properly exploited. I expect Sinclair to sell at least 20,000 in the UK in the first year if he can build them. And he could even sell 10 times that right if he gets his marketing right. So he liked that. I think that's a pretty good uh, good one. So there we go then. Obviously the rest of it is moving on to the Amstrad era. But I uh, thought that might be an interesting look at some of the, the magazines um, just that covered the Sinclair computing products. And uh, if we've got time left now, maybe we'll take a little look at that uh, Sinclair Cambridge play Moon Landing and an MK14 doing the same, shall we? Now then, my uh, Cambridge programmable is quite old. Um, it's got the classic mod because the, uh, the power switch fails, so that's been soldered uh, out. Um, the battery uh, compartment, I've lost the back cover. The battery actually sits quite proud, so it was like a bulbous connection in it. Um, and the battery connection has been taken out. Um, and not a lot of people perhaps realise that that's a 9 volt positive tip uh, power feed for the calculator, which is the way you, we used it back in the day anyway. So I've just got um, one of those multi voltage set to 9 volt with a connection on the end with positive tip. So when you plug it in, the calculator comes on. And we can see it, uh, it works. So um, uh, hopefully you can see the, uh, the display. Um, I did have a sort of bright idea, maybe uh, looking at uh, the moon landing program for this. Um, I think there's a, uh, if we swap over actually, I'll put the book outside and put the calculator by there. We can see what we're doing. Um, and of course the moon landing game, well, it's a well-worn page. Um, but it's uh, quite a long program and it's actually, I'd forgotten this, it's in two halves. So you've got the um, getting out of orbit stage, which um, calculates the values, because of course you only got 35 steps to program the calculator. Um, so the uh, getting out of orbit stage, and you end up with a value at the end, which you feed into the second stage, uh, which is um, the exact equation of motion during a vertical descent modelled. So it's quite a good one. Um, and then you basically tabulate your decisions, which is um, uh, allowing you to, to see where you're getting against the, the height and, uh, and travel. So maybe we'll make a video about playing that as a separate one, because I think it's quite a lot to do. Um, and co we'll compare it to the MK14 version as well. So maybe we'll just take a quick look at the uh, at this uh, uh, in a different way. Uh, while going through it, I actually found this, which is... Uh, a program that I obviously wrote back in the day um, for squares of numbers between 10 and 100. And I'll notice I mentioned the Cecil equivalent. Um, so that's the program in Cecil for anyone with a Cecil interpreter. And um, so continuous pressing a run will produce the output cycling between the values. So we could enter this. Um, okay, so it's uh, not too complex a program to enter onto the calculator. Now, in order to set the program steps up, you do. Um, I think it is uh, down, down, which is does the select set, and then I think it's go to there, and then it's 200, is it? And we go to go to zero, zero, so it's go to because go to is on the two key. Sinclair had lots of functions on the keys and to step zero, zero, which is what we've got. So these are now the um, we're at step zero zero of the program ready to go. But that actually instructions think the front of the book. I know on mine I've seen some people have got a separate instruction booklet, but I'm sure mine this is all I have which uh, has the instructions on it. Um and then you can basically go down uh, so it's shift again and you need because that does the shift and then that's the run button which is learn above it. 
So that's what we got. So we're now ready to set our steps into uh, to run the program, to put type the program in. Now the program sheet has um, instructions on how to, uh, what to do there, and then the the actual program is here, and then the keys that you've got to press to get that symbol is there for speed. So hash is on the three symbol. So you may see this accelerator. It doesn't take long, so it's going to be. Th three and it's step number one is now going to be overwritten which is going to it's got nothing in it and it's going to have a one in it and then i'm going to put a zero in it and then we're going to put an, a minus sign in it which is a shifted equals um which is we on the equals and then we're going to store which is on the two so we can see there's a two so a store and we're going to have the uh, the uh, dot which is the x um, and then we're going to have the recall, which is on the 5, and then we're going to have the minus, which is on the equals, and then we're going to um, have a stop, uh, which is on the 0 key, and then we're going to do a recall, which is on the 5 key, and then we're going to minus, which is on the, uh, it's, got a, it's an F, and then we're going to do a hash, which is on the 3, and we should be on step 12, yep. Um, and we're going to do a uh, uh, step 12 is going to be a 1 and then we're going to do an equals and then a shift and then a gin which is go if negative so that's on key 1 which is to click there and then we're going to go back to step 0 0 so we've got two zeros to go in on to, and step 18 is the next one we're going to do which is another shift and that's going to be the go to so the downward shift and we're going to go back to step four so zero four now that we've entered that step 22 is blank which is correct so the next thing you need to do really i believe then is to um if we look at our code programming instructions you when you've put that in then all you need to do is to press the uh, clear entry, which goes back to it. Um, we can have another look through it if we go to um, shift again, go to 200. And we can now see that the first uh, value in step 00, zero is the 3 on the side, which is correct. So basically you can go through and check your program if you want to. I believe that's just by doing the, um, you do the shift down. Uh, which obviously is up down shift which gets you the step now the f is the check symbol which is supposed to be an a so i may have a a top right corner bit gone there but it doesn't matter you can tell the difference um so then that will step to step one then so stepping through we got two which has got a zero in it and we do a step to the it should be on step three should be a minus sign which it is um and if we keep shifting it through we got a two a full stop, a five, a minus, a zero, a five, etc. F. You obviously can't see the reason for it. That's why you keep this. This is almost like the source code, and this will be the assembly language. So uh, when you finish doing any of that, um, we could do a shift shift. So if we do a shift shift, and I want to do a go to um, uh, zero zero hopefully and from here now we will be able to press run to run our program and there's the square of 10 correctly and then the next one is going to be the square of 9 and then the square of 8 and the square of 7 the square of 6 <laughs> the square of uh, 5 the square of 4 the square of 3 the square of 2 um, square of 1 is a 1 obviously and now it's going to realize it's got to the end and it's going to loop back round again after it's got the zero. It's going to realise it needs to go back round and start again. So it's going to continuously give us the squares. Here we are. So it's a fairly straightforward programme. Well, Sinclair Cambridge programmable. It's surprising what you can actually do. And then there's a huge range of, of programmes in this, this manual for lots of mathematical. Of course, I played all the games on it. <laughs> um, but there you know, it's, uh, it's plenty to explore in it. Um, and certainly for us, uh, we were interested in electronics. So hopefully you found that interesting. Um, as I say, we'll maybe do a, um, a video of the MK14 and this playing um, Moon Landing as another video. We'll leave it there.
course, uh, we leave it there. As soon as I do that, that program's gone. And this piece of paper will be needed the next time it's being entered. So that's the Sinclair Cambridge Programmable. An innovation for 1977 from Sinclair Radionics. Oh, it might be nice. Quick look through uh, some of my old popular computing weeklies as well. Um, just to... Uh, and Gilbert's on the top. I used to get this uh, obviously very regularly. These are a bit of a mixed pack, but um, so this is uh, July 1983, volume 226, front page. Electric car project rolls on. So there's early early notes about that side of it. Um, what else we got on the uh, obviously the pie man on the back. <laughs> um, so what else we got? Sinclair's dual processor. It now seems likely that uh, Sinclair's new professional computer is scheduled for launch in 84 with a dual processor machine. Incorporate monitor and twin microdrives. So they, I think maybe people were confused, likely a Z80 as well. Obviously they're talking about the, the Intel processor which is used for offloading some of the I.O. But maybe they were thinking it was a Z80 going to be in there to make it compatible with the Spectrum. So to use it using perhaps spectrum as uh, stations on the network which it could do with some unreliability so that's uh, september of 83 um what else we got we got um january of 84 ql is now um official on the launch there close and claire and nigel the photo we used earlier um obviously it moves from being the newspaper we went now to the more glossy magazine so July of 84, we got confusion over QL software, perhaps being in ROM. <laughs> uh, so there's plenty of uh, news items moving through the years, isn't there? Um, October of 1984, so sort of the first week. Sinclair profits down, turnover rose from 54 million to 77 million, but profits were a disappointing, uh, rose only by a disappointing 253, so quarter of a million to 14.28 million. I wasn't doing too bad then, was he? Um, Sinclair confirms a portable computer is going to be working on uh, to be launched in 85. Um, a single microdrive flat screen display and a new price of around £300. Wow, so he was no flat screen TVs, as I remember them. Um, so we got October and 85. Um, so that's pretty close to. That's a whole year later now, yeah. So Sinclair holding the lid on the UK 128 after it was revealed in uh, Barcelona Computer Fair on in September 23rd. Still got my scratch card for the magic, look at that. And of course then you've got uh, first Spectrum 128s hit the uh, hit the UK in November, December of 85. So uh, uh, there you go, a good, uh, good snapshot of the... Uh, the period okay, so this is my MK14 V6 slothy board hooked up to the uh, Martin Lukasek uh, copy of the VDU expansion card for it. There's an INS8154 IO simulator. It's a bit of breadboard, some wires to jumper it, so it's in graphics mode. Uh, just turned it on. Pi programmers by there. So if I ask the Pi programmer to send a bit of program to it. And it blanks the screen because that's the only way it can work. You can see the numbers clacking up on the uh, LED screen. And it types in the program for me. And once it's finished typing the program in, way, look at that. That's the Fallen Man demo running from Practical Electronics. <laughs>